you're gonna want to take this down. Well, Whitney, thank you for joining me on this episode of Take This Down. It's a privilege and honor to have you here with me today. And just want to thank you for taking time out your busy schedule. Thank you for having me. Thank you for asking me to come. No, absolutely. You know, one thing I always like to start off every episode is, is telling the guests why I invited them on the okay. show. Uh, you know, you and I met when you were at TCU. Uh, you coached the teaching, the student athletes, and I had the opportunity to come in and speak, being a Baylor Bear and everything, talking to the TCU. Still can't family. believe we did that. <laughs> but nevertheless, but you know... Um, you know, I really enjoyed, you know, meeting with you and we kept in touch and then started to see all the things that you were doing in the community. Uh, just from, you know, just general awareness on different disparities within Fort Worth. And it was aspiring. And so when I was thinking about different people who I felt like needed their roses, mm -hmm. it, it was you were one Aww. of the first people that came to mind. So. So thank you. Thank you. So just to kind of jump right into it. So who is Whitney Boyd at her core? At the core, at the core core, I am my father and mother's child. Like I am the daughter of Charles and Elfrida Boyd. I'm the granddaughter of Bertha Mae Price. I'm a small town girl. I grew up in a very small town in rural Arkansas, um, Humphrey, Arkansas to be exact. And I'm still that same girl who grew up there and I've just been fortunate that God has given me a lot of opportunities to add people to my life and get connected with people across the the country and world and just been very fortunate in that. But I'm still the same girl who grew up in the small town, moved to Palm Bluff, went off to college and just kept going and growing and challenging myself to, to be who I was purposed to be. So how was it growing up in a small town, you know, of Humphrey, Arkansas? Yes. What, what population, what... 5,000, 10,000. Try 800. Oh, okay. <laughs> like when people start talking small town, like I'm like, y'all, I'm for real. Like it's it's 800 people. But I think that that's where I learned community. I am extremely fortunate to have grown up there because I grew up in such a sense of like people and valuing people and valuing relationships. That's where I learned how to communicate with my elders. I grew up every day after school, going to my grandmother's house. Um not only me, but my cousins were there too. And we just kind of learned how to support each other, depend on each other, love on each other, but work things out. Like you're growing up with a lot of kids, right. come from a really big family. My daddy is one of 15. My oh, mother, wow. I know, is one of six. So I have a lot of cousins. Both of my parents are from that same town. So I grew up surrounded by people who love me and who I got to love on and just who continue to support me. So when I think about like Humphrey and what it meant to grow up there, it really does mean community. And then I moved to Palm Bluff, which is a bigger, for me, that was the city. Like that's where we went to the mall. Everything was in Palm Bluff. Love to eat. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, cause we didn't have sit down. Right? We had some establishments, but they weren't, there weren't a lot of sit down places in Humphrey. But um, Palm Bluff is where I really got to figure out what all I learned in Humphrey and really grow there too. So my dad is a pastor. And so we moved to Palm Bluff. I think I was like 14. It was the end of my world at that That's point. Right. Cause I was like, why would you move me? And like I'm a 14. teenager, my right. friends, all my friends. Like I was telling my students the other day that I had a class, like my whole grade was 20 kids, <laughs> not just the class. Like that was my entire grade was 20 kids. Wow. So, you know, from growing up in Humphrey and transition to uh, Pine Bluff at 14, did you feel like you were prepared or do you feel like, you know, coming from a small town, you were mm -hmm. behind, you know, your, your peers in Pine Bluff or how was that transition for you? That's a really good question. I remember. Um, so in Humphrey, we had honors classes, but we didn't have AP. It was a very small school district. We didn't have AP classes, but I remember that I knew I was smart. I was in GT, all these things. And I remember going to Palm Bluff and I wanted to be in the friends that I made. They were in the AP classes. So I'm like, how do I get in those? Like, right, right. and I remember wanting to do AP classes. And some of the people at the school felt like, well, you can't. And I was in the 11th grade at this point. And so they're like, you aren't used to this rigor. Maybe you should just try the regular classes. And But my mother, who is an amazing advocate for me in education and all that has always been, was like, no, let my daughter take the AP classes and let her 
figure out she can do it because I know she can do it. And if she can't, then we'll we'll right. revisit that later. So my mother advocated for me to be in AP classes. And so I was able to be in AP classes and I thrived. I graduated with honors, um, all that. You know, it's just, he said something that just kind of sparked. It's just something about mothers willing to advocate for their child. It reminds yeah. me of, of, of when I was in high school and I was in ninth grade and it was like, oh, you know, we think that he's X, Y, Z. And my mom said, no, y'all want to just challenge him. Put him, put that boy in a, <laughs> exactly. those AP classes. And, you know, it's kind of the rest is history. But mm -hmm. it's because my mother advocated for him, similar to like Absolutely. how your mother advocated for you. So, you know, with knowing that, OK, I belong, mm -hmm. you know, how did that project you for your next steps? Yeah, I think like going from all that I know, like from kindergarten through literally starting the 11th grade with the same kids, you know, I, I knew there that I was smart. I was able to lead there because it was very familiar too. But then moving to Pond Bluff where I was a little fish in a big pond, mm -hmm. I had to really find my space and my voice in like leadership <laughs> opportunities. It's okay, all that. And so I think that was really good for me because it helped me get prepared for college and what was next. And, and, and so what was next for you? I went off to school at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, home of the Razorbacks to be exact. Beautiful campus, beautiful, beautiful campus. campus. And so, you know, Humphrey, Arkansas, Pine Bluff, you had to have culture shock going to Fayetteville. <laughs> I did have culture shock going to Fayetteville. I remember when I was looking at colleges so Palm Bluff has a great institution, UFUB, which is right there in Palm Bluff. And it's a great school. And I knew that I visited Fayetteville, heard about it, and I was interested. But what really sealed the deal was that I got scholarship money to go to Fayetteville. I got full scholarship funds to go. I mean, I was applying everywhere. You know how you're a kid and you're not really sure you know you have to pay for college, right. but you don't really know what that means. Right. It's like Monopoly money. Yeah. Somebody's paying for it. I was it, like, it's oh, like, you know. well, my daddy and my mama usually pay for everything else. So, duh, they'll pay for this, too. Right. I had an older brother who was actually at UAPB, and I knew that he had scholarships. So, I knew, like, okay, I got to figure this scholarship thing out. Um, and my parents actually had a very real conversation with me, which I always advocate for parents to have real conversations they're like, if you want to go to Fayetteville, you can go, but you got to get scholarships to pay for it. This is what our money will pay for. Right. And the rest, you got to, you know, you got to mm -hmm. figure that out. So I worked really diligently to get scholarships. And I was fortunate to get scholarships to cover my cost of me going to Fayetteville. They also reminded me that when I went, I had to keep my scholarships <laughs> to stay there. So I also went with that mindset, like I'm going for academics and I have to graduate. And so how was your experience on campus? So my experience on campus, it was just like what I learned in, in Humphrey growing up. It was finding my community and leaning heavy on that. Like that's a place where I feel it. I feel like I really was poured into with like mentors. Being a young black girl from a small town in Arkansas going to Fayetteville was a culture shock because there were people there from everywhere. Um, I grew up in a space where I won't say it was racially diverse. It was actually majority white in Humphrey. But going to Fayetteville, it was that times like 500, right? right? And so me figuring out that and really, it really forced me to figure out the type of leader that I wanted to be. And like, you've always been called a leader because you've been in spaces where people knew you. They don't know you here. Right. So I really had to carve out my own path there. Right, right. So, you know, you know I'm a big Malcolm Gladwell you mm -hmm. know, reader. So you always hear big fish you know, small pond, small pond, big fish mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, would you say that you kind of had, you know, the, you know, the concept of where you was this big fish in Humphrey and now you had to go to this big pond and, you know, try to still stand out? Like, how was that? Yeah, even in Humphrey, like, I, I feel like even with it being a small school, like I knew everyone, but I was still um, definitely more like nerdy. <laughs> in high school and then in college like I got to really own that like it was cool to be you know because right, I needed to get my academics so right. and I was paid to be there to be smart and so I got to really like own that in a way that felt right for me but in Fayetteville I think that had some really great people I was a business major a marketing major so while in college of business we 
What people don't realize about Northwest Arkansas is really like home of a number of Fortune 500 companies, including Walmart, J.B. Hunt, Tyson. Like, right. So I was watching people who were leading these companies come into my classes and all of that. And I was really trying to figure out, OK, well, how do I become that? How do I do that? And I got to watch people. I joined a sorority my freshman year. And so even then I had an alumni chapter in the area and I got to watch women who look just like me be leaders, legit like VPs at Walmart, all these things. And so watching them, watching women and people on campus who were supporting me really helped me to figure out, okay, that's the type of leader that I want to be. I want to really do that. But I think also something that's always kept me rooted and grounded was my faith. So I grew up, my dad is a pastor, his pastor my literally my whole life. And I always leaned back on what my faith and how my faith guided me. And so, I mean, I was the kid in college. I was going to Wednesday night Bible study on campus. Um, I still went to parties, all this stuff. <laughs> I was a very regular college student. But I think that really helped me find like how I wanted to lead, who I wanted to engage with. And it, it worked out though. I got to really be a leader. Fayetteville challenged me to like, okay, are you the really the leader people have put you up to right, be? Right, right. And I got to figure that out. Well, you know, I was going to wait to transition this because, yeah. you know, we have something in common. You know, we're both PKs. <laughs> you know, being preacher kids, you know, we have to just, you know, to debunk the rumor that we're the terrible kids. We are not terrible. You know? So why are PKs the best? No. But, That's a good question. <laughs> but I will say this, though, and you and you love to get your thoughts and feedback. You know, growing up with, you know, um, pastors as, as fathers, and even for me, my grandfather's a pastor, my brother's a pastor, my uncles and cousins are all pastors. So yeah. it's, it's always been around me. But I always tell people that experience has allowed me to meet people where they're at and mm-hmm. be able to talk to people from all you know, walks of life, wherever they come from, socioeconomic status, demographics, right. you know, has would you say that's been your experience as well? Yes. I think that we do get a bad rep, but I never <laughs> understood that. Like, people are like, oh, you got to watch those BKs. And I'm like, watch us what? Well, you know, I mean, I, 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 I made some people uh, <laughs> right, but. <laughs> you, I mean, but it was because we were just regular kids. Right, like, right. my daddy's a pastor, not me. Right, right. Um, but I think that watching my parents in ministry really helped me too to learn love and grace for people in a way that I don't know I would have learned aside from that. I mean, watching them love people who and offer grace to people who maybe didn't have their best interest at heart or who maybe mistreated them. But I also I also grew up in a very loving church environment though. Like I feel like the people that we've that my parents have led like in ministry have always loved on us really hard and then made that easier. And they also understood that we were kids. Right. And I'm right. just, and my parents understood that we were kids. Yeah, you know, and I think I had no idea our conversation was going to go here, but now yeah. since we're here, you know, I almost say that growing up as a, as a preacher kid, it's harder mm-hmm. because you see things and you, you're asking why and the explanation don't make sense. No. <laughs> it's like, wait, what do you that doesn't make sense or you know why are we doing this right. or how right. can you you know forgive this person mm-hmm. or you know why isn't it like this for us if you're supposed to have this vip pass to god daddy right <laughs> like can you just ask god to do this real quick and then just boom like right. let's go right. yeah i think one of the things that i think about often is i think pastors also get a bad rep but i don't think that people think about it in the impact that it has on like families too like my dad was often having to step in the gap, stand in the gap for other people. Like we would have vacations. We would go on family reunions. We had to come back either really early Sunday morning or late Saturday night because we had to be at church. Right. Or maybe we had to do something different because someone passed away. He had to go to a funeral. So things always looked a little different. So we all were making sacrifices alongside him. Right. Um, but I also really genuinely believe that my brothers and I have been blessed because of those, that obedience that my parents had. Um, I, I believe that we've reaped the benefits of that. That's good. That's good. So you, you're at Arkansas, marketing degree yep. in hand. You're ready to go take on the world, right? <laughs> so I thought. <laughs> you thought. So what did yeah. you end up doing after undergrad? So I told you, like, being in Northwest Arkansas, I really thought that I was going to be like, you know, you watch TV shows and you see the people who are, like, working for these corporations. I thought I would be, like, living in some downtown area of some big city being a VP of marketing, just like living this life. Then I did an internship and I was like, 
I don't know if I want to do that. But I knew, again, that scholarship money was powerful because it kept me. And I was really interested in the marketing side. But because I was so involved in college and I got to do different leadership things between Greek life and just leadership development, first year experience, I really started to realize how much I love like that of working at a college. And I was a part of this organization that helped you understand what it meant to actually, you know, you work right. or you go to college, but you don't really think about the people that work there. Right. Like, oh, this is their job. Like right. they do this every day. And so I decided that I wanted to pursue higher education as a career. And I had a job offer for my internship and I was applying to graduate school and I was waiting to hear back from grad school. But I knew I had a job offer and they were going to give me they were very, very generous. They were going to give me a while to make a decision. So I always knew I had that in my back pocket. But I decided to go off to LSU and pursue a master's in higher education. OK. You know, before we transition to LSU, I wanted to ask you, you know, did your marketing skills come from your, your pecan business that you had as a little kid? <laughs> that pecan business is serious. <laughs> So it did. So I also grew up in a space of like entrepreneurship. So my father was always in sales too. And my mother actually had a business degree, but when, so she worked for like a corporate, but then I always wanted to be a teacher. And when I was maybe in middle school, she went back to school and got her certification to become a teacher. So I always grew up in this environment where people who were in business and honestly, I can't believe I'm going to say this on camera. My older brother was a marketing major. So I became a marketing major. It just <laughs> felt right. I was like, oh, my family does business. Duh. So I became a marketing major. But that for con business, I told, I've been an entrepreneur for a very long time. But growing up in that small town, we had a lot of like fruit trees. We had pecan trees, plum trees, all of the above in our yard. And one su- I mean, not summer, one fall, I decided like, I'm about to make money off this. So I go outside. <laughs> I'm picking up pecans. And had an uncle who worked at like a, basically like a factory over in Palm Bluff. And he helped me source sales. <laughs> like I had so many sales. Like I ended up having to get my brothers to help me pick up pecans. And then we had so to send them I had payroll. <laughs> I don't know how much they made, but everyone had a really great Christmas <laughs> because I was selling pecans. Like I had packaging. I had a system. We would take them. We would get them um, cracked and shelled at this place that would do it. Then I would sit there. Get them ready to go. My uncle would take them and sell them. See, the the the, the people that you were looking and aspiring to in college, you were already there. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I'm like, I can really show you all how to run Walmart. I should have told them that. <laughs> so, you know, armed now, you you know, you're prepared, you're equipped, you head off to LSU. Mm-hmm. That's another culture shock. I <laughs> it is. It is. So what's interesting is I have, again, my older brother, he's had a lot of influence on me. My older brother actually lived in Louisiana. Okay. Um, he lived in Hammond, which was like 45 right, minutes right. from Baton Rouge. But that summer before I went to stay with him because I did my internship in Baton Rouge. Okay. And so that's where I really like I knew about LSU, but I was like, huh, maybe I'll like apply to LSU. And my brother's there. So I get to, you know, be around my brother. And I went off and LSU, Arkansas was a really big school. LSU was a really big school. Right. And so it was still different though. Being in Baton Rouge just was, Baton Rouge was the cap is still is the capital of Louisiana. All these different things of being in what you know the city is larger than Fayetteville, um, but it was good. It was a good challenge. That was my first time having bills because <laughs> I stayed on campus like all through undergrad. I stayed on campus. Then two of my sorority sisters, who literally like just real life sisters, we all went off to LSU together, and we got. A three bedroom, con- three bed, three bath condo. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Listen, we weren't just doing it; <laughs> we were doing it. And I don't think that we realized that most of our grad student stipend was going to go to our rent, <laughs> but it did, indeed. So y'all ate a lot of spaghetti, you know? <laughs> well, no, in Louisiana, I feel like we ate a lot of jambalaya because yeah. it was <laughs> hey, whatever's going to stick and last for you know. You get pizza on campus. I feel like at LSU, we always they all, always offer free jambalaya. Gotcha. So you get your master's degree in what, higher education, mm-hmm. correct? And so did you know what you wanted to do at that point? I don't know that I've ever just fully known what I wanted to do, but I um, I actually wanted to move to Texas at that point. I wanted to move to Texas. I think Memphis was on my list. All these different places that I felt like would be close enough to home, but 
I could also live in a bigger area. So you wasn't gonna let your big brother pick your next move? No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. I think he was still in Louisiana at that point when I was leaving Louisiana. So um, applied to jobs, and I actually ended up back in Fayetteville. That was the last place I thought I would end up, <laughs> but I ended up back in Fayetteville at my alma mater, and I was working with Trio program, Student Support Services. And I fell in love. I fell in love with working with first gen college students and really helping them navigate. I think that's, they are who taught me what it meant to like advocate for an identity that you didn't, because I wasn't a first gen student, right. but I got to learn a lot about their experience, but also figuring out how do I advocate from their perspective and the voice and what they're telling me they want. Because, you know, I would imagine that they have no one to go to and ask, like, is this normal or what am I supposed to do in this situation? So they're kind of walking, you know, blind, if you will. And you were able to provide that resource and also that sounding board for them. Was that fulfilling to you? It was. I think that I learned so much, though, too, on not how to make assumptions about people and their experiences because I enjoy like research and all that. So I would read a lot of things about like, how do I, what do I need to understand about the students that I'm working with? But what I realized where they were, there was so much more depth than what the research said and what experiences of people and practitioners said about first year students. And I got to really hear from their perspective, things like they lack academic preparedness, they lack parental support. And that wasn't true for the students that I was working. So I knew there was something deeper to the story. And so I did that for maybe three years and I got to learn a lot. But what also the motivation that they gave me was that in order for me to really be able to change policy that happens for first gen students and students of color, I had to go get a terminal degree because I, I had to accept that. And one of my students was like, you know how you graduate and you're like, okay, if I don't do this again, I'm good. Like, this is going right, to be it. Right. But then I realized, oh, no, there's something else I got to do. Right, right. And one of my students reminded me, he was like, I thought you said if you never got another piece of paper, you were going to be good. I'm like, yeah, jokes on me. <laughs> so where did you ultimately get your PhD from? I ended up leaving uh, Arkansas, leaving my job to become a full-time graduate student again. And I came to TCU. Fort Worth, Texas, Texas Another Christian shop. University, <laughs> just like home, right? No. <laughs> so how was that transition? Was this your first time living in Texas? First time living in Texas. First time living in um, a city the size of Fort Worth. I had family here, so I visited Fort Worth. But this was my first time really um, living in a space like this. Uh, TCU was way different than the schools that I've been at. I've been at large state like land grant institutions right. and TCU was what felt like really small private institution in the middle of a major city. Yeah. Cause I'd imagine when you came to TCU, it wasn't as big as it is now and it's still it's relatively not. small compared to yeah. Arkansas and mm -hmm. LSU. Yeah. You know, how, how was your experience, you know, doing your PhD and being at TCU? I think something that I wasn't expecting from TCU so I knew I was coming here for graduate school and that I would thrive there. You know, I, I would get to know community, but I wasn't expecting all that came, all the opportunity that came for me at TCU. TCU was most definitely a place of opportunity for me. And I didn't know how all of it would unfold. So how did it unfold for you? I mean, I came... I. I remember coming to visit TCU and I actually met someone. I, I didn't know anything about TCU. I'm, sight unseen. Sight, well, I met someone, um, Dr. Mills, who was the program director for the the program that I did. Doc, Don Mills? Don Mills. Yeah, yeah, we serve on the food bank. Oh, together. really? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I met Dr. Mills at a conference and I tell you, this is probably like my countryside company. He can sell water to a drowning man. He can. Right? He can. If you know Dr. Mills, you know this. Yeah. And... I met him at a conference and I remember I wasn't ready to leave my job at that point. So I was like, OK, there's this school there. And I love what he was saying about the program. I could come in and make it my own. All that was very appealing to me, but it wasn't the right time. And I remember going back to that conference and I was like, hey, Dr. Mills, I'll be there. I would love to chat. I think I'm ready to talk more about TCU. Then I came to visit and I met with different people. You know, Dr. Darren Turner, I got to meet with Dr. Turner because I needed to know, like Dr. Mills was one person. Um, I had met Chris Hightower at the conference. Chris is a salesman, too. You know, I don't know 
I would have been more impressed if you were able to turn down Don Mills and Darren Turner after right? speaking with them. I would have been more impressed. <laughs> I was not able to turn them down. And so I applied to TCU. I got in. I came. And I remember when I moved to Texas and I left my job, my job with a salary and benefits to become a grad student again. And I remember I I go to church at Mount Olive on Evans on the south side. And I remember Pastor Glenn preached that morning about when faith, I mean, when facts don't act up, add up, that's where, that's when faith kicks in. So when facts don't add up, that's when faith kicks in. And I remember pulling up to a gas station and I just started boohooing because I was like, what did I just do? Like, I just left my job to become a grad student. Who, when, where, and why? <laughs> and so that took a lot of um, prayer and just trust and faith in God that I was going to be okay. And even the whole journey to TCU happened in an interesting way, but I remember someone reaching out to me and I knew I would have tuition cover because that was a part of the package. But someone reached out to me about working in their specific office. And I was like, oh, OK, like, yes, I was interested in it. It, it meshed well with what I wanted to do. And then a year later, Dr. Mills and Chris were like, you should apply or no, you should be the graduate student in the chancellor's office. And I was like, the who? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know him. He doesn't know me. I'm not sure about that. I really like already what I'm doing. I get to work with students. And I remember they set it up and I went to go meet with Chancellor Boschini. And I remember him being like, I usually usually like to like know who I'm hiring, like make a decision on this. He was like, but I, let's see. Like, so we both were kind of like, okay, we're going to see what it's about. Like, you know, I want to back up just to make sure that I, I heard it correctly. You said when facts don't add up, that's when faith kicks in. That's when faith kicks in. You know, that's something that you want to take down because that that's yeah. good. I like that. Yeah. I like that. And so you're working in the chancellor's office, mm -hmm. you know, you're essentially you're on the mountaintop at TCU. <laughs> but, you know, I get a sense that you maybe still might have a sense of unfulfillment or something missing. Yeah. Is, is that an accurate assumption? That is an accurate assumption. So I told you early on, like I grew up in community and community means a lot to me. So I got into TCU and I found a sense of community at TCU and people who were supporting me, pouring into me, all of that. But I also knew that I needed to find community outside of TCU because that was really important for me. And specifically as a graduate student, I knew for me to thrive, like I needed to know and feel the city. Like I needed to feel people outside of TCU and feel like a connection with people outside of TCU. Uh, so I went on this journey of finding community outside of TCU. And I would just say that you have not only went on this journey, but you know, now you are a pillar in the oh, community gosh. within Fort Worth. And, you I'm know, pillar. I think that some of the things that you do or are part of are great things. And so would you like to talk a little about some of the areas within Fort Worth, within the community yeah. that you're working on or that you have a passion for? I have a lot of passions, but at the root of it, it's people. And so actually, when I first got to TCU, I was applying for this fellowship, the Spicer Fellowship. And it's you are looking at some disparity in the community and you're wanting to fix it or you wanting to support like removing barriers around it. For me, that was education. My work with first gen students told me that education, there's a disparity with in our education system. And so I was connected with actually um, someone at Rainwater who, and they were working with the Morningside Children's Partnership at that point over in 76104. And I got to meet Mr. Andrew Chambers with the Morningside Children's Partnership. And he took me in and he allowed me to do my work around building a college going culture in Morningside. And that was literally the first year I was here. I was like, I don't know anything about Fort Worth. I don't know anything about the schools. I know there's a big district, but I don't know anything about it. But he really took me and him and his team and they let me do my thing. I got to work in the schools. I went to church over there already. So I knew something about the community. But that was really a springboard for me. And... From there, I mean, now I'm working with Braver Together and I get to go back to 76104. We'll talk a little bit about Braver Together. Yes. So Braver Together is an organization committed to transforming 76104. So if you know the story or the study from UC Southwestern that talks about 76104 having the lowest life expectancy in the state of Texas, what we know about that is 
but the lowest life expectancy is really happening is on the east side of the highway 35 right. in the black and brown communities so we look at the historic south side morning side and hillside communities and how do we build pathways to health equity through economic development education health care and housing so we get to walk alongside community members who have been invested in the area for decades years and they either live work play own a business grew up in 76104 and we get to walk alongside them to help address issues around how race shows up in the health equity and their disparities even with the hospital being right down the road so i was just going to say you know within what 10 minutes you're from the medical district mm-hmm. in downtown but yeah here lies all these disparities yep yep so we know that there has to be some deeper reason that this is happening. And we know race plays a huge issue in that. And so we're actually looking at that, facing it head on to figure out what do we do to help support people in the community who have already been doing the work for decades and who already have ideas, who have things, but they need support in helping those things come to fruition or scaling their ideas. So we get to work with nonprofits. We get to work with for-profits around capacity building. And for me, it was like, Definitely. When I talk about my path, it has not been linear by any stretch of the imagination, but it's all come together in a way that I know has been orchestrated by God. All right. And let me let me ask you this question. You know, I, I didn't grow up in Fort Worth. I grew up in Arlington, you know, came to Fort Worth around the same time as you. Did you feel like you were met with any barriers of like, who's this outsider coming in to try to work in our communities? Or was you embrace like oh mm-hmm. come on you know we, we yeah. need all the help that we can get I think that's really interesting that you asked that too because I remember when I started with Morningside Children's Partnership like super eager excited like had a heart for people you know all these things right. they didn't know me and so I think that that was a reminder of lean on what you know you know people you know how to build relationships and I had to lean heavy on that and I had to take some steps back to where I was willing, I remember Mr. Eddie Griffin, who um, I was getting ready to go do like an essay writing workshop, right? And he is someone who's very rooted in the Morningside community. And I remember him sending me a message like, basically like, who are you? (laughs) Where did you come from? Like, and I was like, okay, it's time for me to take a step back to figure out, okay, I got to build this relationship first before I just have all these great ideas. I think people knew that I had a good heart, but they needed to know my heart first. And so I had to pause and do that. I think something that was interesting, though, I was also entering community from the aspect of having the TCU brand to support. So what I realized was that Fort Worth was so much bigger than what I knew from TCU. Like I would when I was going to in community on behalf of TCU, a lot of times I would end up like downtown Fort Worth, you know, in other areas on the west side of Fort Worth. But I'm like, this city is way bigger than this. There has to be other areas and other places that I can connect. And so I was fortunate to have that help me open up some doors, but I also had people who would go before me and like really say, okay, y'all chill out. She's okay. (laughs) I know she's like this girl who's always going to talk about being from Arkansas, but uh, that helped me to get into some doors. So, you know, my experience was with with Dr. Michael Bell, you know, sitting me down and questioning, you know, but, you know, now still to this day, I can call Dr. Bell. He can call me. And it's just, Sometimes people just want to know, are you are you mm-hmm. you here for the photo op? Or are you here right. to, to do what you say you're going to do? And I think that's important when you're, mm-hmm. you, you know, because it's it's a heart business, not you know, business. Uh, just what you can get out of it. Yeah. And so I always appreciate that about the elders in Fort Worth. Yeah. Uh, but it's also, you know, when you're outside, it's like, I'm just trying to help. <laughs> it's like, wait, <laughs> I wasn't. I'm not trying to say. But you know what I figured out? It was like, just keep showing up. Right. And if right. you keep showing up, they keep seeing you, then they're going to. They'll, they'll, they'll let you in. Just like with anything, consistency. Yeah, yep. You know, so how was it navigating leadership within Fort Worth? Yeah. When I think about, like, just navigating leadership within Fort Worth, I, I think I had to learn some lessons around what it meant specifically for me, like, not only as someone coming from outside of Fort Worth, but even just with my identities, my race, gender, all that, and then understanding that it wasn't the same for everyone else. So I think that I had to take some steps back, too, to figure out where I sat in spaces of privilege around being able to get access into spaces, but how not to leave the door closed behind me 
to where other people who maybe they um, they enter Fort Worth or they enter leadership from a different way or their approach is different, whatever. But me really understanding that my way of doing things isn't the only way. But how do I also create opportunity or support other people in their pathways to leadership? So I have seen it be very difficult for people to enter into leadership, especially in a way that feels authentic to right. them. And so I've been very cognizant of that and really respecting that for people to understand that people are leaders in their own way and within their own communities and have their own paths to leadership. But also using what I am at a table to challenge people to say like, well, why can't that person be a leader? Just because their approach is different doesn't mean that they're not a leader and that they shouldn't be a leader. Or why is this type of leadership what feels most comfortable? But how do I specifically for me, um, how do I create other pathways to leadership for other black women? Because I know that black women have the keys to success in so many ways with our creativity, our boldness, our approach to life, our understanding of life, our lived experiences. But how do I really allow for myself to be a conduit for other people to get those opportunities? And, and when you say comfortable, you're really meaning safe. Yeah. 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 Because, <laughs> yep. you know, a lot of times that, you know, you see the same five, six people mm -hmm. who um, that that are expected to do everything. Right. And so, right. you know, when you speak on leaving the door open, I I love that because, you know, when I'm given opportunities, I want to one. Uh, I always say, if you're going to be present, be present. Yeah. And But also know that I need to leave an impression for the person that comes back behind me that looks like me have those same opportunities. Yep. And so I think that's that's great on what you yeah. speak on. Do you feel like that approach has been met with resistance for you, though? I think that it has been in some ways because um, when people have an idea of what they want and I challenge that idea, they're like, well, that's not what we had in mind. And I've seen that in community, in the workplace, and all these different spaces. But I think, again, showing up in a way that's consistent and persistent to what I'm advocating for has helped me because I'm not giving up. Like, I'm the person in a board meeting, I'm going to ask questions. And I'm like, if that makes people uncomfortable, that's okay. Because I also know what it's like to enter spaces not built with me in mind. I enter spaces every day where I'm uncomfortable, right? Right, right? So if my questions or me asking the question about, okay, well, how is this impacting said group? How is this impacting black and brown folks in Fort Worth? If that is the question that I need to ask or how are we supporting black and brown business owners? How are we doing this? I'm gonna keep asking because I feel deeply connected to that. And I feel that is deeply connected to why I am in the room. And I've, I've taken ownership of that and I'm just not afraid of the question. But I think that a lot of that has come because of me discovering who I was. So. Right. Right. But I think also with that is that, you know, I think there's an added component because it's, you know, you, you're asking those questions. You're mm -hmm. having the tough conversations, but you're not saying, hey, do it this way. It's right. like just trying to provoke thought and provoke conversation, mm -hmm. which I think is important to have in any of those rooms. And yeah. so I think some accountability, right. 100%. And accountability for when it happens and understanding, too, that and it's not just my responsibility. It's the other people in the room, too, like my white counterparts. You know, it's, it's also their responsibility to make these things happen. Um, I remember there was someone who's also on a board with me and who told me about, I really appreciate the things that you're saying like in the meetings. And I told her, I need you to say those things in the meetings. I need you to bring those things up or say it in the meeting. Cause sometimes you can feel like you're on an island by right, yourself. Right. Right. So how do you, but I also have been really intentional about deciding what spaces I'm in. You know, let's have this conversation mm -hmm. briefly. Do you feel that you have to, you know, change or people expect you to change who you are, how you approaching because you are a black woman? I think at one point I did. Um, I I also grew up, you know, I was being teased for like, oh, you talk like a white girl, like, and not really understanding like, what in the world does talking like a white girl mean? You know, um, but I, I do know that at some point it was an act of survival because of the spaces that I was in. I was trying to survive in those spaces. And so I did take on habits and behaviors that probably wasn't me or that they weren't me. And then some of them weren't me. They were just, that's just how I talk. That's just what I'm interested in. But now understanding myself as a black woman and being able to enter those spaces with my two strand twist, whatever it is that feels authentic to me, but also getting to decide who gets what parts of me because everyone doesn't deserve all of me. And I'm okay with that too. 
that's something else you want to take down. You know, not everyone deserves to get the full, Absolutely full year. Absolutely not. You got to protect yourself. I have to protect myself in that. And I think that what I have discovered that is going to always be consistent is my voice and how I use my voice for people. Because that's just, that's who I am. I mean, I was raised by a bold black, bold black woman. Like, my father has always poured into me and... I mean, my daddy calls me Angela Davis and I'm like, daddy, I wish I was like Angela Davis. I am not like Angela Davis, but I do pursue the same things. I want justice just like she does. Right. And so I think that being raised in those affirming spaces and continuing to be affirmed in that way has helped me to find my voice and have a consistent voice that's true to who I am. That's something that's not going to change. And for everyone listening, this is the second time Angela Davis has been brought up in our conversation. So if you haven't Googled who she is (laughs) by now, you need to. Please, please look up Angela Davis. Through all your community involvement, you know, for communities with the cause, the mm-hmm. braver together, you know, you yeah. recently awarded the woman of the year for the Girls Inc. Yes. You know, how did that make you feel? I think that one felt really special, too, because it's the bold woman of the year award, but it was talking about being a champion for women and girls. That felt very special because. I just think about me as a young girl, like and all of the women that I had who've been champions in my life. I already talked about my mom, my grandmother, my aunties, my mentors, my sorority sisters. And I was like, whoa, like, hold on. You're telling me that I am a bold woman and I really got to own it. And just my little cousin came here from Arkansas to celebrate with me. She's like, she's 15. She's in Girl Scouts. She's a bold girl. She's like really owning her girlhood and she came and she celebrated with me so that was just a moment that i just felt really good about you know when you were growing up in humphrey texas humphrey know, arkansas hum- no. oh lord humphrey arkansas <laughs> please forgive me whichever camera is on humphrey arkansas <laughs> my apologies uh when you were growing up a uh, little girl you mm-hmm. know with your thriving pecan business yes did you think that you would be recognized for being a bold woman no i was a little girl that was seen as shy in so many ways, like because I was what I was also trying to find my voice, trying to find like what any of that stuff meant for me, trying to make sense of the world around me, trying to figure out what in the what does this world even mean? Like I was sheltered in a lot of ways, being in a small town, um, going to college, even going to Pine Bluff, I realized that there were a lot of things that I was just really naive to and that the world wasn't as just black and white as I thought. There was a whole lot of gray. <laughs> so finding my voice through all that gray and then being called a bold woman, it was like I really have found my voice. And as much as I'm still that same girl finding her voice, I think I found pathways to use my voice. And that's what's meant the most to me. You know, I saw a quote that you mentioned, and I may butcher it, but I... Uh, You said something about, you know, not dimming your light. Yeah. You know, speak on that. Yeah. Uh, Ella Baker, a civil rights activist, she said, give light and people will find the way. And for me, through my years of life and what I've experienced is not allowing anyone else to dim my light because my light is bearing light for other people, too. Like, if I allow people to silence my voice or quiet me in some way, I may be blocking something from someone else finding their light and being a light for someone else. And a lot of it is tied back to my faith too, with like me being truly believing that I'm called to be a light and owning that and figuring out what that looks like has helped me a lot. And I think that's come from mentorship and being put in spaces that my time at TCU, specifically in the chancellor's office, I was I got to serve on the chancellor's cabinet and that was like all the vice chancellors and the provost. And I'm like, oh, gosh, <laughs> what in the world? How did I end up here? Right, right. right. And I didn't have I was still in grad school. They were making decisions literally for the university. Millions of dollars. I was like, what? Like I would literally sit in meetings and like, how in the world did I get here? But then slowly I started to find my voice in that space. I started to figure out, OK, this is why God placed me right here. And I started to see how these things were interconnected and it helped me to take that what I was doing in there outside of there, but also build connections with the community. And I got to really discover people and how that light could shine 
pathways and and brighten a pathway for someone else. You're talking to a young lady or you're talking to a young man and, you know, they may not have the confidence. They may be shy. How would you encourage them or tell them to not dim their light? Yeah, I think um, a lot of that for me has come from just doing a whole lot of self work, really discovering who I am. And once I got to discover it, I'm still discovering it. I was able to walk with a different level of confidence because even as I met people along the way who were different from me, I could embrace that because I knew who I was like. And that came from everything from understanding like myself as a Christian, understanding myself as a woman, understanding myself as a black woman, understanding myself as a sister, a daughter and finding my voice in all those different spaces really helped me to own it in other ways. I mean, I grew up. I was teased growing up. Like I wore glasses, all these things. Like that was a normal thing of a what felt like normal childhood things. But I always knew that, okay, I have something in me. I just didn't know how to unleash it until I was able to get opportunity. So I tell kids all the time, like when you're given opportunity, take it. And this is coming from someone who grew up in a small town. Like we didn't have all these extra mentoring. We didn't have access to those things. Right. right. So when I did move to Palm Bluff and we had some of those things, my parents put me in those things, but I also wanted to be there. The only thing I really quit was piano <laughs> because it was moving too slow. He wanted me to play like finished. Twinkle Twinkle a Little. And I'm like, come on, like, let's get to it. I didn't understand then that you really need to know the foundation. Right. That's why I needed to start there. So once I understood the foundation of who I am is Whitney Danielle Boyd, like it changed the game for me and it helped me to own my voice in other spaces and really walk into spaces with confidence, not in a way that I feel like I have all the answers, but I also found strength and humility and vulnerability to know that I don't have all the answers, knowing that there's someone smarter than me in the room, but still being able to find my voice. Gotcha. You know, when we... When we sit back down 30, 40 years oh, from gosh. now, and we're at, you know, your big retirement party. It's going to be a big party. <laughs> where, you know, you've done all these great things in the community. There's statues and buildings <laughs> named after <laughs> you. You know, gosh. how do you want to be remembered? First, I want to say I hope that I have less than 30 years to retirement. <laughs> Technically, I probably do, but I'm working on some things to hope I don't. But either way. What I would like to be remembered as someone who walked in their purpose, but it didn't stop there. I think that my purpose is creating and helping other people discover their purpose and empowering them to walk in theirs. That's good. I think that, I mean, that's why I'll never stop working with students. Even with me transitioning from TCU full time, I'm still teaching there because I know that a part of my calling, it is helping other people discover their purpose and I can't leave that. So that's what I hope that I'm known for. That's good. That's awesome. Well, you know, I know we're at the end of our time, but I thank you so much thank for you. sitting down. You know, it's very insightful to me, uh, you know, and hearing your story, hearing your journey and the impact that you're not only making in our community, but the lives of so many who, that you are touching and making better who may never know your name, but mm -hmm. who are growing up and coming through the community you were leaving the last and imprint. So thank you again. Thank you. And if I ever need some pecans, I know who I'm calling. So. <laughs> the tree is still up. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Take This Down. You're going to want to continue to stay engaged because you never know who our next guest may be. We're available on YouTube and anywhere you listen to podcasts. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.